What is a meta-analysis? Stick around and let's chat about it, here today on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Jay Phoenix Singh, and I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to advance your career in academia. Now, before we get started, you guys know that I appreciate the love, so please do take a moment to like this video, share it with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students, subscribe to our channel, hit that bell to make sure you get notifications every time we post new original content, and also like us on these social media accounts. So let's jump right into it. What exactly is a meta-analysis? You may have heard this term in the past, and frankly, it sounds so statistical that I don't blame you for probably not just looking it up somewhere else and trying to get a sense of it. Now, meta-analysis and systematic reviewing, which is closely related, and I'll be sure to make another video on that for you, uh, both of these methodologies, they, they go together, and what they do is provide you with a 10,000-foot view of a given field of scientific research. They are absolutely essential to progressing science forward. What I have found is that without doing really high quality reviews, we just keep doing the exact same studies, testing the same hypotheses over and over and over again without making any real meaningful progress. So what my goal today is, is to be able to provide you with four key pieces of information concerning meta-analyses that are going to help you really have an appreciation for them uh, as an art form, you may say. So that's going to be our goal today. Topic one that I want to discuss with you is the concept of a systematic search. Now, for a meta-analysis, the first thing that we want to do is identify every possible research article that has been published on a specific topic area. And what you're going to do is you're going to use one of these or multiple databases, something like a Google Scholar or a uh, PsycInfo, Embase, Medline, Synall, Eric. Depending on the field that you're in, there's going to be one or multiple different databases that are kind of the go-to databases to be able to search for articles. And you're not just going to want to just will nilly type anything in, you're going to want to pre-specify the search terms that you're going to use. And you may even combine search terms using things called Boolean operators. Things like the in capital letters AND, OR, uh, the use of quotation marks to be able to search for a specific set of terms together, the use of parentheses, there's all kinds of these Boolean operators that you can take a look at. Uh, if you're wondering how to spell Boolean, it's B-O-O-L-E-A-N. So if you Google Boolean operators, you should get a, a big list. And depending on the database that you're searching within, different Boolean operators can or cannot be used, so you should take a look into that. But at the end of the day, you want to apply as many filters as you would like. For example, let's say that in my old field of forensic psychology, we want to do a systematic review, uh, taking a look at uh, instruments like checklists developed to predict the likelihood of domestic violence. So we may have different terms, things like violence risk assessment and domestic violence and spousal assault and intimate partner violence. All of these different related terms that we're going to search for articles for. But then we got to set some filters. Let's say that we only want to take a look at studies that have actually been published. No government reports, no conference presentations, no master's theses or doctoral dissertations. We want to limit it to just peer-reviewed papers that have been published. And when? Only the last 10 years. Only studies conducted in the United States. Only studies of male perpetrators. All of these things, right? We have to really write it out and then limit ourselves, such that even though we may have this initial universe of studies, we then need to be moving down and systematically screening out and screening in articles until what we've got at the end of the day is this crystallized set of articles that meet all of our inclusion criteria. Now here, of course, you're gonna have some really unique things, and depending on the meta-analysis that you're conducting, you could honestly uh, do it in any number of ways, but think about little complications like this. I find three studies that meet all my inclusion criteria, but they're all in the same sample. 
Article number one is, let's say, a sample of a hundred domestically uh, viol uh, violent men. The second one is the exact same set of a hundred men, but it's a different set of analyses. And the third, again, yet another set of analyses. What am I going to do with these three? Because if I quantitatively put them all together, there could be all kinds of statistical problems with that because it's overlapping individuals. There's not independent samples between the three of them. So there's so many methodologies that have been developed within the general field of meta-analysis to be able to deal with these sorts of unique issues. The goal of this video is to just give you the 10,000 foot view, really. There's a lot of great books actually on meta-analysis that we can chat about some other time. But this is step number one. Identify your little subset of studies using this very systematic search process. The second topic I want to discuss is what's called a summary effect size. Uh, there's so many different outcome statistics that you could find uh, throughout the field of stats in general. Everything from Z's and T's and F's and chi-squareds and gammas and uh, phi's and everything in between. There are so many, so the goal today is not to be able to go through them, but I just want you to understand that let's say that you've got an outcome like an odds ratio, for example, right? And I've got 10 different studies that my systematic search has identified. Well, what I would want to do is calculate the odds ratio for each one of these 10 different studies. So using our domestic violence prediction example, I'd want to see how the checklist that's been used to predict domestic violence in each study, how does it perform? So there'll be an odds ratio for the instrument amongst all 10 of the different studies. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to quantitatively synthesize them using meta-analytic techniques and end up with a pooled odds ratio. Okay, this is one summary odds ratio. And that summary odds ratio is also going to have a variance parameter, just like you'd have a standard error for each one of those individual studies odds ratio. You're gonna have a pooled standard error as well. Uh, and so this is what we refer to again, you'll hear this term, summary effect size. That's what we're talking about here. And there's a lot of ways you can graph this out as well. You'll find very unique sets of figures that you can build for meta-analysis uh, one example of this is what's called a forest plot, where you'll have each individual study listed over on the left-hand side, and then you'll end up having on the, uh, the x-axis, the y-axis, on the x-axis, basically a standardized uh, scale of summary effect sizes, okay? Uh, and so, for example, let's say it's Cohen's D, right? D of zero would be here, and then it would go, you know, D going up and D going down. And then for each one of those studies, you're gonna have, usually it's a little square, right, for each study, and that's going to represent each individual study's effect size with a little line next to it, and that'll be the confidence interval that's a, or standard error, depending on the kind of force plot you use, uh, that's associated with it. And then at the end of the day, it kind of looks like a forest with all these little individual trees, that's the idea. And usually at the bottom, you've got the summary effect size, which looks like a little diamond, and the length of the diamond usually is the confidence interval, and usually it's a 95% uh, confidence interval. That's just one example of numerous different figures that are very unique to meta-analysis. The third topic here is the concept of heterogeneity. Now, heterogeneity, uh, in essence, just means that both within individual studies and then between studies, uh, how much do effect sizes vary? So in this case, how many odds ratio, how much do odds ratios vary? So for example, in the summary effect estimate, right, where you take each one of those individual effect sizes, you put them all together, right? In that together, that summary effect size, right, how much of it is due to variability in individual studies, right? So essentially, how much variance is there Okay, so for example, let's say I've got those 10 different studies. This one is all on older men. This one is all on younger men. This one is all on middle-aged men. And then I got really old guys. And then I got children. And age is all over the place, right? Maybe there's some sort of a systematic effect that can be attributed to age. Well, the first step is identifying whether or not there is between study heterogeneity that warrants exploration. And this can be done either using something called a Q-test. People like calculating 
calculating, it's Cochrane's Q. People like calculating Q because it gives you a p-value. People like the idea of statistical tests. I don't like Cochrane's Q though. I much prefer something called I squared. Uh, and I squared is going to give you out of 100%, right? Um, how much of that summary effect estimate is going to be influenced, is going to be due to between study heterogeneity, okay? So that's the reason that I like I squared instead. To me, it's much easier to be able to interpret than Cochrane's Q. And of course, with Cochrane's Q, you've got issues of statistical power. So this way, if you're uh, you know, your number of samples in the meta-analysis is massive, it could be overpowered, meaning that, you know, your p-value can be influenced, right? But this is something classic in null hypothesis statistical testing, right? So, it is what it is. You find it in individual primary studies, you're going to find it in meta-analysis as well. So that is heterogeneity. And finally, we have sources of heterogeneity. So now we know, maybe using Q, maybe using I-squared, that heterogeneity actually exists. Great, now we need to figure out exactly why. Now in a systematic review, right, where we don't quantitatively synthesize anything, we can look at studies and find patterns and trends, but we can't statistically test whether or not those patterns and trends actually account for differences in effect sizes between studies. We can do that though with a meta-analysis, and you usually do that through one of two techniques, either subgroup analysis or meta-regression, even though again there's a lot of techniques, this is the two big ones right now. Subgroup analysis could basically be that, um, again, we're checking out these checklists to predict domestic violence in men, and maybe we say, okay, um, we're going to separate out um, studies where the sample of men has an average age of under 25 and samples where the average age is above 25. And then we add this two different sets of studies, right? And then I take a look at the odds ratios, the pooled odds ratio here and the pooled odds ratio here, and I compare them against each other using 95% confidence intervals, and I see whether or not they're sufficiently different or not. That's the idea there, right? But again, there's no p-value. It's not a statistical test. Uh, and also, this is really only useful for categories, right? So you couldn't do like each, you know, each uh, mean age for each sample and see whether that reflects on effect size, right? Instead, you gotta separate into groups and then test the groups against each other. Versus with meta-regression, you can do that. You could say that the independent variable that we're looking at is the average age for every sample and then the outcome variable is going to be the odds ratio of every sample and you can basically take a look at them together using this meta regression methodology and so people like that also because it does produce a p-value and a lot of people like that because they're used to it in statistics and I get that as well. So that's a general overview of the field of meta-analysis and meta-analytic techniques. Now there's a lot of different kinds of meta-analyses. Uh, there's new approaches literally coming out every single year. So this is the 10,000 foot view. And depending on what field of research you're in, different styles of meta-analysis, tabular meta-analyses, effect size meta-analyses, network meta-analyses, individual data analysis or IDA. There's so many different techniques that you can learn. And depending on your study design and the field that you're in, you're going to end up finding that you have a lot of options, which is not a bad thing. All right, everybody, thank you so much for stopping by. Please don't forget to like this video and really share it with your friends, your colleagues, and your students. Do us a huge favor and comment below, even just to say that you enjoyed the video, because it really helps us out when it comes to the YouTube algorithm, and that helps us to be able to grow the channel even more. So we really appreciate it in advance. And if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one career mentoring or to be able to talk about the bits and bobs of exactly how to conduct a meta-analysis, please don't hesitate to get in touch via the website below. Signing off for the day, everyone. Don't forget to get out there, take chances, and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.